Good morning, and here we are again. It's Tuesday morning, and uh, uh, I'm not quite old yet. I got another year. I'm 69 today, so I have entered my 70th year. You know, and as the old saying goes, if I knew I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. We're in Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah is going to give a long and sometimes rambling, but, and I don't mean he's rambling from important things. He just makes many points. It's not rambling. I ramble. Jeremiah didn't. Uh, but he addresses many different aspects of Judah's disobedience. And uh, he's talking about the restoration and conversion of Israel. And uh, it's going to, what he's talking about is the millennial kingdom, the, the kingdom that we pray to come, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. There will be a literal 1,000 year kingdom on the face of this earth. Its headquarters will be in Jerusalem. Its king will be the Lord Jesus. And at times during that thousand years, it will be a co-regency with his father in the flesh, David, the king, who will also rule in Jerusalem at that time. He will rule, Jesus will, with a rod of iron, and the law will go forth from Zion. And he won't brook any nonsense. <clears throat> he will not be thrown. There will be no riots. The lamb and the lion will lay down together. The bear will eat grass like an ox. And the kid can stick his hand in the rattlesnake pit. It won't hurt him. That time is coming. It's real. It's described in the book of Isaiah in great detail, the millennial kingdom. It's going to last for a thousand years. The first part of chapter 20, it says it lasts for a thousand years. And, uh, as a matter of fact, it says it six times. So if the millennial kingdom, which is called the millennial kingdom because it lasts for a thousand years, if it doesn't last for a thousand years, then why does it say six times that it lasts for a thousand years? Read your Bible. Believe the words it says. Pay no attention to people in $3,000 suits on television to, who tell you to think it says something other than what it says. It says nothing other than what it says. The Bible says what it says. And uh, we try to make up, as people, we try to make up and, and uh, believe that it says something different because we don't want to obey what it says. Chapter 23, we began here yesterday. The Lord says to Jeremiah, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. You have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings what our pastors do to us now. And I'm not talking about preachers. I'm talking about our leaders in the government, our governors, our state government, our national, our federal government. These losers that we send there, I don't know how they get elected. They just got a lot of money, I guess, because <clears throat> they're just piss poor representatives of uh, the people. All they care about is which oil company or which pharma company will give them a lot of money. That's all it is. I haven't found an honest man in the Senate. 
I don't see one. I don't see an honest man in the house. They're just not there because they're bought and paid for by their corporate overlords. There's not much we can do about that. Now, if I could go and run for Congress, I'm an old man. You could just go and say, hey, I'm Jimmy. I'm running for Congress. And I could do that, but nobody pay attention to me. Nobody put me on TV. Nobody put me in a debate. I could run all I want to. But because I'm not the pawn of, you know, the banks or the oil companies or pharma or agribusiness, well then, or, you know, the chemical, the chemical industry, the anti-environment mental industry, uh, I'm not going to, nobody's going to listen to me. Nobody will hear what I say. I mean, of course, I'm free to run. It's a free country, right? I wouldn't even be a blip on the radar because I don't have the corporate money. And anybody who refuses to take corporate money, they won't be elected. Except maybe in some very liberal district in California or Oregon. They, they might get elected there. But not in normal places. It just wouldn't happen. So... The people scatter the flock, the pastors drive them away, and the pastors don't visit them. Once they get to Washington, they don't care what happens to you or me. All they care about is raising money for their next campaign and quashing any <clears throat> challenges that might come up to meet them. I wish things were a different way, but they aren't. I'm not going to candy coat them, even this early in the morning. You know, I know you like syrup on your pancakes. Well, I just spill vinegar on them. How about that? <laughs> Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. You have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited him. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings. God is judging us right now. The same as he judged Judah, the same as he judged Israel. All empires fall. We have no free pass. We don't get an exemption. We are falling now. God is destroying us. One crisis at a time. One loss of faith at a time. One abominable sin at a time. He is destroying us now for the same reasons. The reasons he destroyed Israel, the reasons he destroyed ancient Judah is because they went a whoring after other gods, idolatry, spiritual adultery. They sacrificed their children. Just like we do. A million a year, give or take. And those are just the ones we kill in abortions. Think about the others we sacrifice to state schools and government schools and indoctrinate them and teach them to hate anything that's good. Teach them that America is a colonial power still. Uh, teach them that we're still in slavers. Teach them that we're, that we're still uh, uh, genocidal against the Indians. Our forebears were. It's history. But, you know, that is the tale of history. You know, we came here and took this land away from the Indians. They were living in the Stone Age, and we were on the edge of the Steel Age. Those two technologies, only one's going to win. But it's the history of the world. The history of the world is conquest. We took this land that we call the United States, we took it away from the Indians who were here before us, but they took it away from whoever was here before them. It goes all the way back to the garden. Murder, violence, sin, or a fallen race, the human race. And until the United States organized, and really, really until the Civil War, 
And, you know, the Yankee Army in the Civil War was the first army that went to war for an idea. They went to war for an idea that, that they would preserve a union where the farmer had the same voice as a mechanic who had the same voice as a factory worker who had the same voice as a professional man, who had the same voice as a politician. The poor man had the same voice as a rich man. That was the Yankee ideal. Was it reality? No, but that's what they believed in. And that's what the North fought for, and that's why the North won, because they had a better idea and better cannon and better supply and better logistics and a bigger army, those things <laughs> also enter into the equation. But until 1863, thereabouts, there had never been an army that fought for anything other than booty. Uh, Titus Pulo, uh, in the, the story of Rome, he put it best. He, he was a soldier. His, his whole goal in life was to was to uh, to fight other people and uh, to steal their gold, drink their wine, and carry off their women. That was the history of warfare until, actually until 1860s. And I can date it to the days between Jackson's fall at Chancellorville and Less around a year later, close to a year later, the Northern Victory at Gettysburg. So, we were different. But now I think we're just like Russia and just like South America. Good morning, Clint. Because our politicians, our pastors, they obey whoever writes the biggest check. I wish it were another way, but I'd be lying to you. So since we deal with reality, we just deal with ideas. This is just, you know, this still applies. These, these pastors that we have, these leaders that we have, they don't visit us, so God's going to visit them. Just like he did Israel, ancient Israel, just like he did ancient Judah. And he judges us for the same reasons. Verse 3, And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries, whither I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. Well, some people think that he's talking about <clears throat> when uh, Zerubbabel and uh, Ezra and Nehemiah come back to rebuild the temple and rebuild the walls, but he's not, because look at verse 4, and I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more. Well, they've never been to a point yet where they have feared no more, Israel, nor dismayed. Yeah, now they're plenty dismayed, neither shall they be lacking. Well, they've been lacking. Saith the Lord, behold the day. You see, it was not fulfilled at the return from Babylon, and it was not fulfilled in 1948 when Israel became a nation because, verse 5, Behold, the day has come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, that's Jesus, and a king, that's Jesus, shall reign and prosper, shall execute judgment and justice in the earth, that's Jesus. All nations of the world will obey him. He will rule with a rod of iron. And uh, the law will go forth from Zion. In his days, Judah shall be saved, yes, both physically and spiritually. And Israel shall dwell safely. Yes, they have not dwelt safely since they've come back to the land. Uh, they're in constant threat of attack. They're in a war right now. And this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Remember I told you that this word was Jehovah Sidkenu. And I always thought it sounded like a, you know, like a Jewish comedian. And tonight, to open the show, we have good old Sid. Sid Canoe, come on out, Sid. 
Smart Night right here on the show. We have that fabulously comedy, comical stylings of uh, Sid Canoe. <clears throat> it means the Lord our righteousness. Yeah, I know I got whiskers. I cut up my face real bad the other day. I haven't shaved since, I don't know, Friday or so, Saturday maybe. But you know, the older I get, the harder it is to see my whiskers because they're turning white. And my hair's getting gray. It used to not be gray, but now it is. Now we begin today's portion. Verse 7, God is still speaking through Jeremiah. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say the Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Remember through all the prophets and uh, Moses and the Psalms and, uh, and uh, the history books is going, the Lord our God, which brought us up out of Egypt, which delivered us from the iron furnace, which delivered us from the land of bondage, which delivered us from false gods, and this God that, that delivered us up out of Egypt, who brought us up out of Egypt, who carried us up out of Egypt. With his strong hand, he brought us forth out of Egypt. He parted the Red Sea. He gave us water from a rock. He fed us manna from heaven. He gave us bread in the morning and flesh in the evening. You know, he fulfilled our every need. Our shoes didn't wear out over those 40 years. Our clothes didn't wear out. We never ran out of something to eat. And it was a wilderness and there was nothing to eat except what God sent down from heaven. That was the deliverance from Egypt into Canaan, the promised land, where their enemies fell before them as if they were cardboard cutouts because the Lord God fought for Israel. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say the Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Now, verse 8, but, but, the Lord liveth, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel. Their descendants could see they will have been in captivity for 70 years. The seed of the house of Israel out of the north country. Babylon is north and east of Jerusalem. You know, when things are measured, when things are given direction in the Bible, when they say to the north or to the east or to the south, this is always in regard to Jerusalem. In God's heart and in the creation, Jerusalem always has been, is now, and always will be the center of the universe. Everything relates to the city. It's a city that's called after his own name. And he will not abandon it, and he will fight for it. And uh, as a matter of fact, he's fighting for it right now <clears throat> because we've decided to stop helping. You know, I hate to see what's going to happen to the United States when we quit supporting Israel. And don't tell, tell him what kind of hurricane or earthquake we'll have if we if we don't support Israel. And said that if you support Israel, he will bless you. If you don't support Israel, he will curse you. We've seen many examples of this throughout modern history. I'm not going to go into them today. I've told you before. But every time we do something that's not in Israel's best interest, we have a hurricane or a volcano or a, or a, a, or a tornado or a flood or something right here in the United States always happens. There are no exceptions. You take me to a date that we made any kind of deal with Israel that was not to their advantage or with one of her enemies. You check up on me, you'll see that the day after we did that, sometimes the day we did that, all hell broke loose here in the United States. 
again, there are no exceptions. When I say these things, it's because I've researched them. I don't have time to give you every episode. One good example uh, that, that, that everybody would recognize is that, you know, we forced Israel to pull settlers out of Gaza. It was part of a treaty to give the Hamas that area and let them self-administrate. And we convinced the Israeli government to pull Israelis out of their houses, out of their settlement houses, and leave behind their homes and their property and turn it over to these dirt-eaten terrorists you know, who sit in the dirt and wait for something to happen. They're all, you know, somehow they think that if Israel's not there, their life will be better, but I don't know how they figure that. Well, the day after we started pulling the settlers out of there, at, at Israel, at our insistence, started pulling settlers out of Gaza, <coughs> Katrina hit New Orleans. And as big as people saw it was, the ferocity and the impact that hurricane was a surprise to everybody. Certainly a surprise to George Bush. Remember his FEMA director. Great job, Brownie. (laughs) This guy, Brown, was an idiot who some friend of Bush's that he had put in there. You know, he wouldn't know his uh, he wouldn't know his foot from his left elbow. And had certainly never done anything in emergency services. He was just some banker, a lawyer, a big contributor, and so he gets a federal job. Great job, Brownie. We really should say great job, Bush, because if you hadn't forced the Israeli government to pull settlers out of Hamas so it would fit your new peace plan, and Katrina wouldn't have hit the United States, You think that's crazy. But I lived through it, and I saw it, and I remember it. I didn't see it on YouTube. Nobody told me. I didn't read it in a book. I watched. And that is why the lessons that you receive on this broadcast are different from many of your other lessons. It's because... I observe and I remember what I observed. And the Lord God is with me and he has preserved me unto this day. And until he's done with me, he will continue to preserve me. Uh, You know, maybe I'll die one day doing this broadcast, but I hope that I was, I hope that I led people to Christ at the meeting the night before. That's what we're going to keep hoping. This is the Lord liveth which brought up and which the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country from all the countries whither I have driven them and they shall dwell in their own land. That hadn't happened yet. More and more Jews from all around the world are fleeing where they are and returning to Israel. It's in the greatest exodus that we've seen since the origin of the state, especially during those days before the partition went into effect, in those days after World War II, 1945, 46, 47, 48, before it became official on May 14th, and that, that, it, that Jews were smuggled into Palestine. They were they were the, oh, the Palestinian mandate, the area that the British controlled, that they were going to give up control on the 14th of May to a new partition state of Palestine and Israel, which was the day that the war began, and it hasn't really stopped since 1948. That's 76 years now, if you're counting. They're dwelling in part of their own land. But now, the Biden administration wants them to pull back out of 
Well, when they call it the Occupied West Bank, it's not the Occupied West Bank. It's Israel's land. It's known as Judea and Galilee. <clears throat> but they're not living in all their own land because God gave them a land much bigger than that. But they will someday when the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, when the Son of David, when the King of Israel sits on the throne of Israel, the people will dwell in all that land. Verse 9, my heart within me. This is this is Jeremiah talking. Jeremiah has an insert here where he speaks. You got to remember, you got to be careful if the context when you're reading Jeremiah. Sometimes God is talking to him. Sometimes God is talking through him. Sometimes Jeremiah is talking to people, and sometimes Jeremiah is talking to God. This is where he's talking to God. Verse 9, my heart within me is broken because of the prophets. You know, see, I'm a prophet, and I say what God says, but the rest of them are false prophets. And that's one of the three reasons that God is destroying Judah and why I will watch the destruction of my country and the captivity of my people is because they have believed the lying prophets who said God would never destroy Jerusalem because the temple is there. And then the later lying prophets, the ones that are in control now, they will not, uh, uh, they will not uh, uh, have any war, that no war is going to touch Jerusalem, that, that, that there would be peace. But now Nebuchadnezzar's army has encircled Jerusalem at this date or almost encircled it. Sometime in 599, he will have completely encircled it to where there's no way in or out. And there's going to be one more line during Jeremiah's day. The line prophets will write to the first exiled bunch, which would have included Ezekiel and Daniel. They're going to write, send letters to them in Babylon and say, hey, just live in a tent or a shack. Don't build houses. Don't do anything there because the Lord says you're going to return in two years. Well, this was BS, of course. God didn't tell them anything. And then Jeremiah, he sends to him and he says, look, the prophets here are lying to you. I'm a prophet of God. And God says that you need to build houses. You need to have children. You need to make good relationships with your captors and the people who rule over you and, and, and earn money and save money because you will return someday or your children will return someday, but it's not going to be now. Your captivity is for a long time. Jeremiah will tell them the truth, but we haven't got to that lie yet. we have only dealing with the first two lies of the lying prophets. Jeremiah says, my heart is broken because of the prophets. Jeremiah realized his responsibility just like I realized mine. I have to tell you the truth. I would not tell you a thing if it were not so. That's just a fact before God. My heart within me is broken because of the prophets. My heart is broken now because of all of the false prophets. We have we have all these lying idiots on television and radio who just pretend that pretend that everything's okay and they're just rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. You got a handful of godly men and women who are preaching the return, the imminent return of Jesus Christ at any minute. That's all we need to be concerned about right now. Is getting enough people saved, as many people saved as we can before the rapture. That is your top job for today if you didn't realize that. You tell somebody about Jesus. I was in Walmart yesterday looking for something they didn't have, potassium. Have you noticed that uh, my wife has to take it as a supplement? Her uh, her doctor uh, ordered it. I'm not a big fan on supplements because, <clears throat> as you can see, my medical degree is not on the wall behind me, you know. But... Uh, I was looking for potassium, and they didn't have any. And they didn't have a lot of things. 
Every winter I buy this oatmeal bath that Avino makes. Walmart quits selling it. Either, and I don't I believe they quit making it, but Walmart quit selling it because they want you to buy this more expensive lotion than Jennifer Aniston does on TV. And well, I'm not going to pay that much. But see, that's, that's why I've always been against Walmart. I hate their business model. Their business model is straight out of hell. What they do is they go into a little town. This is how they started. This is how it happened here in Ozark. They go into a little town, and they put everybody else out of business, and then they don't carry the things you need. You wind up having to search for them on Amazon or on the Internet somewhere else because Walmart only carries what's most profitable to Walmart. They don't give a crap about me or you or anybody else. Again, I would not tell you something if it wasn't true. Their goal is to put everyone else out of business so that you have to buy from them. My heart within me is broken because of the profits. All my bones shake. I am like a drunken man, like a man who wine is overcome. Now, I know what that feels like because I was a drunk. I know what it feels like to be overcome with wine. I know what it feels like to be overcome with sin and lust. Of every type, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. I understand what that feels like. Now, this is Jeremiah here. He's so weakened by the lies of the prophets that he's taken it to heart. He knows it's not his own sin, but he grieves for it just as if it were. Every time I see a liar on TV lying to God's people, I go, please, please don't say that. Don't tell these people that. Don't tell them that there will be no war. Don't tell them that everything's going to be fine. Don't just tell them peace and joy when they're, you can have joy in the Lord, but there certainly ain't no peace, no physical peace. And there's not going to be until the Lord come. The land, my heart within me is broken because of the prophets and all my bones shake. I'm like a drunken man, like a man who whineth overcome because of the Lord and because of the words of his holiness. See, I know how, not only do I know how holy God is and how separate he is and how perfect he is and how great he is, I know how weak and horrible and, and sinful this generation is. But even more important than that, I know how awful I am. I know how wicked I am. I know that the heart is, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I know that I'm just as bad as the society I'm preaching against. Because in my flesh there dwelleth no good thing. The only difference between somebody like me and somebody like you see on TV or in your everyday life who doesn't care anything about the things of God is that I have surrendered to him. I am his minister. I am an ambassador. And I'm going to tell you everything he says. It's right here in this book, but hardly nobody reads this book. That was a double negative, wouldn't it? Hardly anyone reads this book. I'm also forgetting how to speak English. For the land is full of adulterers. We're going to, I'm going to include this next verse because after this we go back to the Lord talking to Jeremiah. Jeremiah says, the land is full of adulterers. You know, we're either physical adulterers or we're spiritual adulterers, which means idolatry. If we're physical adult, uh, adulterers, then we're guilty of adultery and we're guilty of fornication sexual immorality, impurity, uh, every kind of nastiness you could think of, we're guilty of all that because we've taken the marriage bed and defiled it. The marriage bed is honorable and all, but whoremongers, God will destroy. There won't be any whoremongers in heaven, buddy. Uh, but to be spiritual adulterers and commit idolatry, that's worse because we're cheating on God. 
And that's what these people were doing. They'd gone a whoring after other gods, Baal, Molech, Chemosh, Ashtaroth, the abomination of the Zidonians, the abomination of Tyre, the abomination of Moab, the abomination of the Moabites, of the Ammonites. Now, if, you have, if you're a physical adulterer and a spiritual adulterer, then you really got it tough. Because it's hard to see your own sin when you're in the depth of it. That's why so many people who are sold under sin don't leave the bondage and can't leave that bondage. Unless somebody like you tells them about Jesus and that the power of the cross of Jesus Christ and him crucified can save them from their sin and save them, pull them out of that situation they're in. You can't do it. I can't do it. But Jesus Christ can. And that's what we got to tell the lost and dying world. For the land is full of adulterers for because of swearing the land mourneth. Hold my beer. I can do it. The pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up and their course is evil and their force is not right. We'll continue with this tomorrow. Uh, this is good stuff. We'll go back to God talking to Jeremiah tomorrow. There's not much in here that doesn't apply to our situation right now. The Lord says, I'm the Lord, thy God, I change not. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He judged then, and since he doesn't change, if he judged then, he will judge now. And he will always be the same because he doesn't change. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he judged Israel because they went a whoring after false gods and sacrificed their children. They believed lying prophets. He judged and destroyed Judah because they went a whoring after other gods. They sacrificed their own children and they believed lying prophets. Beloved, he is destroying the United States today for the same reasons. Because we have gone a whoring after other gods. We sacrifice our children and we believe lying prophets. God bless and keep you. Tell somebody today that Jesus is coming soon. They need to be ready. God bless you.